So thank you very much, uh, Alexander. And I, I would like to thank Ramona Futiade too uh, for this invitation. Though I shall not talk about medieval philosophy and I shall only f say a few words of, about French philosophy, since they knew that I work on Scottish Enlightenment and since they insisted, <laughs> I took this invitation as uh, a suggestion to offer counterpoints and uh, perhaps in the discussion to draw parallels. I begin with two remarks. Uh, first, uh, I can begin uh, with the end of uh, Christian's uh, talk. Uh, the notion of human nature in the Enlightenment, especially in the Scottish Enlightenment, cannot be reduced uh, in, my, in my mind to the one that is attacked by thought in existentialism is a humanism. And uh, we, we could dwell uh, on Hume's detail, but uh, to speak about Reed, Reed, Thomas Reed's delineation of natural powers does not ascribe a fixed determination to human beings because it features only their capacities and amongst them the, the free powers, in a way. But undoubtedly, Reed's thought is metaphysical and it refers to a human-created constitution. So I take this uh, invitation uh, as a, a challenge and to, to, to understand how the use of the notion of perfection of human nature could help us uh, to understand our existence in, in, in the very uh, deep sense of existential aspect of our life. Second uh, point, I, I shall speak about politics uh, and perhaps uh, you can remember Merleau-Ponty in science in his notes on Machiavelli, he says, we have to keep in mind two things. Firstly, pure mor morality is sometimes cruel. Of course, he, he could refer to Savonarole and so on. And secondly, he says, pure politics, that is, politics as such, demands something as morality. I think that Reed's connection between science of politics and natural jurisprudence could parallel this conviction, although I, I, I'm aware that the parallel between Merleau-Ponty and Reed has strong limits. Perhaps we could uh, speak about that in, in, the con in, the, in the discussion. So, in his work dealing with the psychology of action, the essays on the active powers of man, published in 1788, read is clear that politics as such is realistic. The essays considers not what the man ought to be, but what he is. See the quotation in seven. Read contrasts the first principles of politics, I quote, borrowed from what we know by experience of the character and conduct of man, and the first principles of morals that, I quote again, show us not what man is, but what he ought to be. He goes on. If man were either a more perfect or a more imperfect, a better or a worse creature than he is, politics would be a different science from what it is. Yet, even in the active powers, Reed came very close to utopian reflections. At the end, of the chapter of opinion where he, sh he showed that it is useful to rely on opinion to govern men, he suggests that it might be instructive to compare, I quote, a civil society trained to virtue, good habits, and right sentiments with those civil societies which we now behold. But he does not develop the point further. The utopian description will come later in a speech at the Glasgow Literary Society entitled Some Thought on the Utopian System. There, in this surprising manuscript, probably written around 1793 after the terror in France, Reed deals with two questions. First, how a form of government which actually exists may be changed. 
His answer is rather cautious, even conservative, briefly developed in the first part of the manuscript and in, in the closing paragraph urging the support of rulers despite their imperfections. I don't wish to dwell on the detail of the publication, but note that this first part was separately published in a conservative journal, the Glasgow Courrier, on December 18th, the 18th, 1794. The second question is the following one. What is that form or order of political society which abstractly considered tends most to the improvement and happiness of man. And the mi main part of the manuscript is devoted to the utopian answer to this question. Reed's fellows, readers, and commentators might be perplexed. Is the notion of perfection useful in politics? Let's consider three notions of perfect things or perfect being perfect beings relevant in politics. First, the notion of perfect man. It seems that Reed's definition of politics excludes that such a notion be useful according to him. Take men as they are, neither more perfect nor more imperfect than they are. Obviously, men could be here ruled men, subjects or members of a state. Ritz's declaration is then opposed to any project speculating on a republic of virtuous men or to any prudential Machiavellian, if you want, advice to always suppose that all men are wicked. Okay, take the second notion, the notion of perfect rulers. Once again, Ritz's opinion is to take them as they are. No need to speculate on perfect rulers. Not only could it encourage some vain hope, but it is by no way instructive in, in politics. Thirdly, the notion of a perfect commonwealth. This time, Reed seems to acknowledge the critical role of utopia. But this critical role remains puzzling. Either such an idea could be a just motivation to change the real society, or it is only a despairing one. Actually, there are clues in the late manuscript regarding to how policies should be adapted to real social historical manners. But apparently, they do not help to understand the role of utopian considerations. Indeed, Reed maintains that antiquity is the basis of a government stability because it makes the constitutional principles strong and sacred. See the last quotation on the handout, customs and manners by which we and our forefathers for many generations have been governed acquire an authority and a sanctity independent upon, upon their reasonableness or utility. To this disposition of human nature, uh, nature I think it is owing rather than to climate or to any peculiarity in the genius of the people that very imperfect forms of government when by a mild administration they have continued for many generations and acquired the authority of antiquity, continue to subsist after they become, they become very tyrannical. Of course, Montesquieu was very anxious to stress the links between physical and moral causes, between behaviors and territorial circumstances, education and social habits, but, and Reed discussed Montesquieu previously uh, in a manuscript dated May the 7th, 1765, for, for instance. But here, according to Reed, there is a first principle at work, no de de determining cause, either national character or climate, can be the foundation of authority, because as such, it is a fact of nature which basically connects the long practice or habit and the authority of government. So Reed concludes, when an ancient government is overturned either by conquest or by internal disorders, the safest way to establish a new one is to keep as much as possible the old forms of procedure and the old names of offices. Why a conservative anti-French revolution journal like the Glasgow Courier published this text is obvious. Fair enough. My aim is not to establish Reed's true opinion on the French Revolution, but rather to consider the political usefulness of utopia, if so. 
Because either to the oral of utopian considerations is obscure. In his book on natural law and jurisprudence, Knud Akansen says that Reed is faced with the traditional dilemma of utopianism. On the one hand, Reed holds that an improvement is possible by education or some institutional reform. On the other hand, by regarding perfection as utopian, he reserves it for another time that cannot be our future. Knut Akansen showed that the Gaussian world, on the contrary, thinks that we can endeavor to implement a moral commonwealth in the future, thanks to education and provided that the politicians do not hinder the natural course of social history. In short, Knut Akansen showed that the Gaussian world turned rich reads perfectionism historical. In this paper, paper, I wish to highlight the interest of Reed's utopian considerations for real historical, that is, true politics. Reed's writings help to distinguish two senses of perfection, a superlative one and an absolute one. According to Reed, it makes sense to say that man is really capable of perfection. Man is really capable of virtue. A virtuous act is a perfect act in the superlative sense that it is the best. But as such, man is not exclusively capable of virtue. He is capable of being vicious, of lying, of being selfish, etc. Absolute perfection would be an exclusive disposition to virtue. As such, it is inaccessible to man. Only the, the absolute perfection is unreal, unworkable, and impossible in practice. In this superlative sense, men, as they are, are capable of doing what they ought to do, according to Reed. Their action can be morally perfect, but the perfection of their nature, of course, is not so in a superlative sense. We may only say that being as they are, they are perfect comparatively to other natures. This is why he says in the active powers that if man were either a more perfect or a more imperfect, a better or a worse creature than he is, politics would be a different science from what it is. In the first part of my talk, I shall consider that according to Reed, speculative politics, in as much as as it provides a description of man as he is, must describe his natural powers, including his moral perfect powers. And in the second part of my, of my talk, I shall argue that utopianism is a way of speculating on, therefore of shedding light on the political measures that should be implemented given those natural powers. I shall conclude on what is utopian in the sense of an ideal that can be pursued, and what is utopian in the sense of unreal and chimerical in its utopian society. So, in his late manuscript, Reed echoes the definition of politics that he gave in the active powers when he introduces the two branches of politics, the speculative one and the practical one. Uh, so you can see the quotation that begins with a man who is the subject of uh, all political decisions, etc. I shall just summarize uh, this um, quotation uh, in the first time. And uh, the following part of my talk, in a way, is a commentary to this long quotation. The subject of the speculative politics is the nature of man or men in the state of nature. That is the subject of this speech, says Reed. There, man is considered such as nature has formed him. Speculative politics deals with natural powers, that is, powers that we have by the virtue of our constitution. In this way, it is realistic. Later, in our manuscript, when uh, Reed describes the advantages of the utopian system, he will write, in all political reasoning we must consider not what men may do or what they ought to do, but what it may be expected they will do in the present weak and corrupted state of human nature. So the subject of speculative politics is not an exclusively virtuous man, nor an absolutely vicious man, but an ambivalent being capable of virtue as well as 
I quote it, barbarity and brutality. The practical branch of politics now deals with, I quote, men who are not in the state of nature but who by education and by the state of society in which they have acquired habits and dispositions which it is not in his power, the politician's power to eradicate and which may be called a second nature. The practical politician has to model and to direct the government of a nation actually existing but Reed then adds an important point point to this second nature as well as to the first, his principles of government must be adapted. His principles of government must be adapted to the first as well as to the second nature. That means that the first nature does not disappear. It operates in such a way that a prudent politician should not overlook the human capacity for virtue. In Reed's words, the state of nature does not occupy the same place nor have the same meaning in the political part of ju natural jurisprudence as in the science of politics. Indeed, jurisprudence and politics has to be distinguished. Political reasoning identifies the means to reach whatever end has been conceived by the politician. But the true art of government is fixed by jurisprudence and defined by the sole end of virtue and happiness. As Reed says, as early as 1766, the political port of natural jurisprudence, I quote, treats of the rights and obligations arising from the political state or the state of civil government and must not be confused with the science of politics. Because the object of jurisprudence is the rules of right and wrong, which are determined by the judgment of our moral faculty. Hutchison and Profendorf are the major figures in jurisprudence. On the other hand, in the science of politics, I quote Reed, we inquire from what causes political events do arise and what, politicals con what political constitutions are most adapted to produce certain effects or promote certain ends. Later, in 1776, he will say that the most famous authors this time in this field are Machiavelli and Harrington. Yet, political science cannot be indifferent to natural jurisprudence since in jurisprudence it appears that, I quote, the sole end of government is the good of the society, that is, to preserve the rights and to promote the felici felicity of the governed, so the science of politics may consider the constitution, the political actions and policy measures to implement in order to attain such an end. In this case, it, uh, science of politics inquires into the political condition of exercising the offices which are defined in jurisprudence, offices whose fulfillment since they fit the nature of man ensures his happiness. But as we have seen, politics must not support that men always act virtuously. It must, it must take them as capable of virtue and bad conduct. Conversely, jurisprudential considerations can be useful in politics. In jurisprudence, as, as Knud Atkinson has already pointed out, Reed thinks that improving morality could be efficacious in politics. See the quotation three, for instance. Morality could be efficacious in politics in order to prevent crimes and injuries, to keep citizens safe and hence to preserve the strength of the society. See, uh, the quotation for two. Uh, he sub suspects that Harrington has overlooked the need for moral and virtue in a commonwealth. To sum up, virtue is a means that the science of politics must take into account and a part of the end that the jurisprudence give to politics. Now I come to the role of the state of nature. The role of the state of nature is not the same in politics as it is in natural jurisprudence. In the latter, the state of man as man is the anthropological condition of a man who is not subject to civil laws. It could be described as the state of natural liberty. More probably, it could be the object of private jurisprudence by contrast with economic jurisprudence which regards man as a father, a, a husband, etc., or political jurisprudence which regards man as a citizen. So 
Uh, in jurisprudence, the state of nature allows the laws that a man as such must obey and the rights that belong to him as such to be drawn up. Uh, not that they may remain in the civil state and not also that private property is a natural right. In our manuscript, Reed is interested in something else than natural right. He is interested in natural powers, that is the powers of a man independent of any historical habits in a particular society. And more properly, he is interested in the system of government that is the best suited to ensuring that natural powers can be exercised in order to promote virtue and happiness. This uh, speculative uh, politics, uh, in this uh, speculative politics. The state of nature is not an ideal contrasting mirror for civil society. On this point, as on others, he opposes Rousseau's use of the state of nature. In a manuscript entitled The Culture of Nature, it was already frowning on Rousseau's representation of the state of nature as, I quote, a non-social state, altogether the most perfect and the most happy, end of quote. Though Rousseau did not really subscribe to such an idealization in my mind, he did regard the state of nature as a counterpoint to civil society. By contrast with the deeds in civil society, he describes the deeds of a non-corrupted, isolated man first, and then the deeds of men together, each of them being interested in their own private good and their dominion in the absence of the general will. The story is told in the second discourse, in the discourse in inequality. In a social contract, book two, chapter seven, Rousseau stresses the contrast. The lawmaker, I quote him, alters man's constitution, and I quote him again, replaces the physical and independent existence that nature, nature gave us by a partial and moral existence, end of quote. Reed does not tell the same story here. The anthropological capacities that are observed in the so-called state of nature in our manuscript, in, in the speculative politics, remain in the state of society. The state of nature always reveals an anthropological fact. For instance, that each of us is absolutely vulnerable faced with the others is an anthropological condition according to Hobbes. The fact revealed by the radiant state of nature in speculative politics in our manuscript is the capacity for virtue and piety. In my paper, I shall only focus on virtue. So what is the state of nature? The state of nature is the state, uh, see the same quotation, the state of uh, uh, the, the first quotation of a being who brings into the world with him the seeds of reason and conscience along with various appetites and passions by which he is often misled into error and seduced into wrong conduct by temptation that arise from within or from external circumstances. Those anthropological capacities were described in the third thesis on the active powers by reflecting on everything that incites us to, us to act, namely on what Reed names the principles of human action. There are three kinds of principles of action according to Reed. The mechanical principles, uh, the, the animal principles of action, appetites, passions, uh, the, the mechanical principles are uh, instincts, habits, and so on. And the third, uh, the third species of uh, principles are, uh, is the rational principles, the pursuit of our good upon the whole. Uh, Reed says also our true interest and the sense of duty, okay, they imply not only desire and will, he says, but also judgment. The ends of the actions that the rational principles incite us are conceived uh, to which, so, sorry, to which the ends of the actions to which the rational principles incite us 
are conceived, of course. But, he says, and as soon as they are conceived, a regard to them is, by our constitution, not only a principle of action, but a leading and governing principle to which all our animal principles are subordinate and to which they ought to be subject. Why? Because uh, take uh, a, a being who, who is governed by law. The subject of law must have the conception of a general rule of conduct and, he says, an inducement to obey law despite some contrary appetites and passions. This inducement is not a mere desire, um, is not a mere desire, not a bare patient. It is the fact for it, the fact of being motivating when we conceive something that is in our interest or obligatory. Um, sorry. Um, so the seeds of reason and appetites and passions in the state of nature in our quotation, means a man's capacity to act according to the principles of action that we just described. It is a capacity by virtue of our constitution. This is the naturalist sense of seeds, of course. But this is not enough to assume that the natural man is only a being of capacity, because as expressed by Reed, by such an assumption, it must be understood that such a man is apt to be tempted. Actually, the animal principles of action are subordinate to the rational ones when we conceive rightly our true interest and obligation. And the appreciation of our interest upon the wall agrees with our sense of duty when it is founded on the right judgment. Now, right discernment of the good and the bad is the work of conscience. And in the state of nature, conscience is only a, se a seed too, according to the active power. That means that conscience, the seeds of moral discernment, like the power of reasoning, has to be, I quote, cultivated and exercised, and that what is said of the wolf faculties of man is particularly true of, the, of their seeds. They may be greatly affected or retarded, says Reed, improved or corrected, by education, instruction, example, exercise, and so on. So what can be done in politics in order to develop the nature of man and so lead him to virtue and happiness? The answer is easily deduced. Measures on education and opinion and actions on limiting temptations without inhibiting motivation or inducement. So consideration of the state of nature provides in speculative politics, not in jurisprudence, provides insights into the efficiency and benefit of politics, separately from the consideration of social circumstances that are proper to a given society and probably historically determined. Now, we come to the description of the utopian system. This is the description of purely political measures whose ends are the natural exercise of virtue and the attainment of happiness when man, men have dispositions and habits that are not historically conditioned in a particular society. Since mental powers give rise to dispositions, since judgment, reasoning, and conscience have to be exercised in order to be improved, the instruction and the discipline of the mind are never disunited. We find this conception of education again in the manuscript of the utopian system where enlightenment, education, and the strengthening of the principles of virtue and true religions are closely connected. In Reed's and the Gulf Towards Time, this, uh, this uh, sort of education is named liberal education. And it is not enough. The Reed says, the principles of virtue and religion need the aid and cooperation of, of other principles of an inferior order. Here again, political action is required and the lever is double. Limiting temptation can prevent ill conduct and love of public esteem, honor and rank can incite to industry and activity. If proportion to real merit, love, and honor is one of the means that lead to a happy society, according to Reed. 
Innovation and incitation have to be combined because the aim of government is not merely justice in the vulgar sense, that is, he says, a, a negative kind of virtue and implying rather the doing no hurt than the doing good to our fellow creature. So uh, it is not merely justice in the vulgar sense. It is rather virtue, including social virtues such as generosity, public spirit, and that is the true sense of justice. There, we find a commitment that we could turn liberal today, promoting industry and activity in society helps to make men happy in society. So, you see, you see for Reed, the challenge is uh, in speculative politics playing his part in the interest of public good. Um, the challenge is the following one, to describe, to describe a state or order of society where temptation is very limited and activity as virtuous and profitable for happiness promoted in several ways. Reed's examination uh, corrects Hume's approach in his political essays, but I have to, to, keep, to skip those points. Reid's answer to the political challenge will be inspired by the utopian system of Thomas More, a social system where there is no private property and where there is an inducement to labor through the pursuit of public esteem, honor, and rank proportionate to merit. Indeed, Reid's utopia is characterized by two features. First, the absence of private property. Secondly, the inducement of labor. I, uh, I sh shall uh, speak uh, about the first of them, but I, I don't have time to develop uh, all the points about the second one. Let us look at the advantages of private property first. Money being the measure of all property, and this is... Uh, uh, a, a rephrasing of Thomas More. Yeah. Money being the measure of all property and riches being the superfluity of property are the root of crimes in human society because they have become uh, the strong and universal focus of human affairs. It equals uh, Raphael's discourse uh, in Thomas More's, More's Utopia. But um, Reed explains that uh, by referring to the principles of action. Okay, besides, private property must necessarily be unequally divided, he says. And this inequality has increased with the progress of society, says Reed. On this point, he may recall Rousseau, but Reed is less interested in showing, that, uh, in showing how private property is the vector of a vicious and just dynamic. His point is, moreover, than I, that, I quote, the rich are as much corrupted by their riches as the poor by their poverty. Indeed, both of, both of them lack the natural condition of man, he says, because focusing on money, they have no regard to virtue or merit. So speculative politics whose aim is to consider political action that will develop the natural powers, present measures that are directed towards the social institutions, money, property, that without bothering to take into account the social historical conditions of this institution. We can call utopian those conditions of life that are defined from a speculative point of view without looking at the social historical conditions that frame institutions we use, customs and manners uh, at a given uh, historical time and in a given territory. Now, we could imagine a region counter utopia, a system of private property that would be unreal in as much as it would not refer to the social historical conditions that might compensate for some of its disadvantages. But it would be real in as much as its effects are real as those that are produced by the principles of action when riches become the universal object of desire and interest and the universal criteria of superiority. Thus, the main disastrous effect is the between the interests of each man and the interests 
of another man, and finally, with the public in interest. Contrast contrastingly, in the utopian system, regard for the public and benevolence affections in Reed's utopian system, without any private property, uh, Regard for, regard for the public and benevolent affections are not in contradiction to opposing interests, the, the sixth quotation. Okay. We could imagine another picture again. Men guided by the principles of virtue and piety may acquire property while remaining prudent, pacifist, temporary, charitable, and so on. Reed does not deny this possibility, but depicting such a system would be a non-political utopia, because this is a possibility, not a probability, and a moral obligation, not a political consideration. The remark, the remark that we quoted above justifies the setting aside of this possibility in politics. See the quotation seven. The problem comes not from property alone, but from the fact that in real conditions, those of man as such, though they are utopian conditions as well, it leads to separating personal desire and interests from duty or benevolent affections. Describing moral men living virtuously in a system of private property would be another utopia indeed, but of no interest to the politician because he would learn nothing about the policy to implement. What politics needs to do is to de describe a utopian system where men are capable of both good and bad conduct and to maintain their moral capacities and their public spirit thanks to political measures. So we have considered the first of the utopian requirements. The second is the inducement to labor through the pursuit of public esteem, honor and rank proportionate to merit. I have to, to, to skip uh, se several points here, but some points uh, in, in, uh, on this theme can appear shocking in, in uh, Reed's uh, utopia. Because in his utopian system, slavery, or at least withdrawing of citizenship, is justifying for those who are so bad that, I quote, neither the motives of honor nor of disgrace are sufficient to make them act their part in society. Moreover, a utopian system is a system of universal publicity and reporting. Reports of averse years and statistical knowledge, I quote Reed, are means to know the strengths of our weakness, the defect and redundancy of the whole political body and of every part of it. No invention is kept secret due to private interest in Reed Utopia. Industries kill on moral behavior of every individual under their charge, he says, has to be reported. This is the price to pay for a meritocracy because in order to ascribe to every individual his due rank and merit, each of his deeds is to be known. This feature of Reed Utopia has a Orwellian flavor. Besides, the, reliab the reliability of such reporting is doubtful. The intentions that must be the genuine criteria for owners could be concealed. So I, I come to my conclusion. Speculative, uh, 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 developed conclusion. Speculative politics is far from being useless. You see, it tends to enlarge our conceptions and to strengthen our faculties, Reed says. Indeed, it has, I quote, a like effect with regard to our intellectual, oh, sorry. Um, speculative politics has a like effect with regard to our intellectual powers as bodily exercises have with regard to the health, strength, and agility of the body. At the beginning of his own essays, essay, idea of perfect commonwealth, Hume expressed a warning that was eliminated uh, in uh, several editions. A political projector is pernicious if he has power and ridiculous if he wants it. But Hume went on, in all cases, it must be advantageous to know what is most perfect in the kind, 
that we may be able to bring in a real constitutional form of government as near it as possible by such gentle alterations and innovations that as may not give too great disturbance to society. After this remark, he engaged, Hume engaged in the description of an ideal commonwealth inspired by Harrington's Oceana. Red Utopia differs from Hume's projection in many respects. First, Hume describes an ideal system of representation based on private property. Secondly, Hume thinks that, I quote, the chief support of the British government is the opposition of interests and that in the ideal government that he proposes, this opposition of interest does all the good was without any of the harm. And thirdly, as we have seen, Hume thinks that speculative politics could be instructive in describing some ideal government that could be gently and gradually implemented. Reid, however, does not want to abolish private property in our historical societies. Obviously, as I, uh, as I said, in his view, private jurisprudence shows that property is a natural right. So what is the role of Reid's utopia? My hypothesis is that Reid sees speculative politics as a means of developing some habits of thought or, way, or ways of thinking. Believing in the human capacity to be virtuous in society leads to regarding the art of government as beyond just a mere administration of self-interests. It thereby leads to political actions of enlightenment, like promoting, promoting liberal education and what today we might call culture, or in Reed's words, learning and arts. Reed obviously trusts that if political speculation becomes fashionable in a way. It can influence the practice of man. Now, we're getting to the end of the quotation, the first quotation given uh, at the beginning of the paper. The practical politician who is the mo to model and to direct the government, etc., etc. The political has to adapt his practice to man as such, capable of virtue and vice, and to man as education, history, manners have framed him. So what is utopian in the sense of unreal, unworkable, and impossible in practice, according to Reid? Not virtue itself, which man is naturally capable of, but the unhistorical conditions that could reduce temptation to nothing and could make the desire for public esteem proportionate to real merit. So what, which conditions? The absence of private property and the public inspection of every individual act and actions. And what is ideal, utopian in the sense of ideal, according to Reid in his late political view? Abolition of private property and control of intention cannot be the ideal of the political measures in practice, in Reid's view. The realization of absolute virtue is the only ideal. Indeed, the practical politician has to keep in mind that virtue is promoted by education, limitation and of temptation and inducement to labor. Therefore, I conclude that Reed promoted less an anticipation of Marxist politics than an alternative naturalistic system to the mechanics of self-interest. And this system could be termed in Reed's and the Gauss towards uh, uh, terms liberal, but uh, the term has a, a slightly different sense from today. And uh, now, we come back to the uh, connection between Reed and Stewart. Reed and Stewart's opposition to the mechanics of self-interest was already noticed by Aro Maas and Shinichi Nagao. Let's focus on the liberal features of politics according to them. Uh, politics promotes liberal education. It is liberal when it promotes education, that is education that renders man more happy and by developing natural powers, and it is based on na another liberal conviction, activity and industry makes a society happy. Stewart's claim to be a read, reads her is understandable for he maintains that true political commitment focuses on education in order to develop natural powers. Virtue is possible, it is within the reach of men, but the struggle against vice necessarily involves combating wrong habits. 
Moreover, Stuart says that social history could lead to political perfection is understandable too as it is drawn from race naturalism because political perfection sets in motion natural powers whose exercise as such is moral perfection, virtue. Perfectionism consists in exercising moral natural powers that are perfect as such and through this in developing virtuous habits. Uh, there is another story here so it's towards trust and sometimes blind faith in the natural course of social relationships and choose from this naturalism but this would be uh, a topic for uh, another talk. Uh, for this conference, just uh, to return to Reed and Merleau-Ponty, I, I have to uh, uh, quote uh, the little text of Merleau-Ponty uh, when he said that um, uh, the, the, the uh, when uh, the, the text entitled The War Has Taken Place, you know, and he say, and uh, just to say that the parallel that uh, I suggest at the beginning, of course, falls short, falls short because Ma uh, Merleau-Ponty is in a way a, a very Marxist uh, thinker. When he says that la guerre et l'occupation nous ont seulement appris que les valeurs restent nominales et ne valent pas même sans une infrastructure économique et politique qui les fasse entrer dans l'existence davantage. Et this and what I shall read now uh, is uh, is not a commitment that Reed will endorse, uh, uh, would endorse. Que les valeurs ne sont rien dans l'histoire concrète qu'une autre manière de désigner les relations entre les hommes telles qu'elles s'établissent selon le mode de leur travail, de leurs amours, de leurs espoirs, et en un mot, de leur coexistence. Là, uh, there, there is a rupture, of course, between uh, French existentialism and the fourth po point uh, of uh, Christian's paper, The Scottish Enlightenment. 